أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم محمد الأمين وعلى أهل وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين آمين يا رب العالمين Dear respected viewers, thank you for joining us once more on this show, your show live from the Holy City of Karbala, back to the basics in which we discuss some of the usual contentions raised and how we can address such contentions in a productive dialogue. Of course, over the past few nights, we have been discussing the worldview of atheism and an appropriate strategy and approach to deal with the whole conflict with those who do not believe in a God and how we can appropriately dialogue with them in a way which is befitting to both their worldview and our own. Of course, tonight is a rather different night for most of you who are tuning in. Um, most of you, of course, are tuning in from the Western world, the English-speaking nations, and so I'm well aware that you are enduring what we currently know as the Christmas holidays. And particularly tonight is the night of Christmas Day. And so I thought I would take a bit of a change of pace and address a slightly different topic. The reason for that is not in case anyone believes that we Shias are such innovators that we actually celebrate Christmas alongside everyone else. Of course, some families may celebrate it as a festive season and as a particular seasonal holiday akin to celebrating any other national holiday. But as a religious festival, obviously, we do not celebrate it. And I am not celebrating it here from Karbala. You do see some changes here in the city with some people putting up Christmas lights and Christmas decorations. But in general, our Shia centers are free of Christmas celebrations just for anyone that gets confused by the title of tonight's show. Rather, the title of tonight's show is a bit of a play on words because I was contacted by a youth today um, on one of my own private uh, social media platforms. And that youth had asked me to engage with a particular video. That video was one which, quite frankly, was somewhat a waste of my time and I wish I could regain that time that I spent by watching it. But nonetheless, I had been asked to address the video and I responded that I was not planning to do so because I've been so busy addressing my own wider family, those who are not Muslims, addressing them with greetings appropriate of the holiday season uh, because it's a special day for them. And of course, Islam commands us to keep good family relations. But my friend actually twisted my leg and gave me a bit of a push in the direction of addressing this particular video under the guise of, well, you can do it as a one-off Christmas special. So that is exactly what I'm doing tonight. I'm addressing something as a one-off Christmas special. And inshallah ta'ala, I'm just doing so in order to reassure my friend who was quite disturbed by what he saw that such issues are not really issues we need to be more than more than aware of really these are not substantial issues and whilst the claims made were very grand claims they were nonetheless merely rhetorical claims claims which cannot be vindicated and when we filter through the rhetoric we see that they lack a heavy amount of substance so allow me to address the video head on, inshallah ta'ala. The video was of course a video of a, of a person I know quite personally actually, a very amicable gentleman who belongs to the sect which calls itself Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. And his particular leanings, if I'm not mistaken, and he retains the same leanings that he used to affirm for himself, and I'm sure he does because it has not been such a substantial amount of time that I have been in contact with this individual, he leans towards the sect known as the Ahli Hadith in uh, the Indo-Pak region or otherwise known as the people of the, who follow the Salaf al-Saleh, the Salafis um, by their own vernacular in other parts of the world. This video was called, of course, Schooling the Shias and of course there's always this great rhetorical gladiator-like theme that goes on when we see people trying to put out such challenges. And because it was done in a public place, allow me to be quite clear, it was done in a venue which we know as Hyde Park Speaker's Corner, a place I used to frequent quite heavily as a student, we saw that the format utilized and the 
the method of really putting out such information was done in a, dare I say, more boisterous and vocal way than one might normally present information were it to be a public lecture or a public discussion. But then again, I don't want to judge because, of course, venues differ from others. And dare I say it is within the nature of Hyde Park Speaker's Corner to have such people put on such entertaining, I don't want to use the word acts, but for a lack of better terms, let's say, such entertaining demeanors whilst addressing others. So let's jump straight into the claims made by my friend. Out of respect for him and out of respect for his age, he's been a very helpful person and as I said, he's very candid despite the fact that we do differ theologically. And he's quite respectful of the fact that life is a constant search for truth. I don't want to disrespect him by mentioning his name and then referring to his claims in a way which shows that they lack much substance. And so I will be addressing him as my candid friend for the duration of this video. But of course, those of you who are wondering what this video was called, it was called Schooling Shias. And so, or Schooling the Shias, of course. And so that should tell you a little bit about the individual. Of course, he's a frequent at Hyde Park Speaker's Corner, but he's one of the more respectful ones. And therefore, I wish to engage with him as respectfully as possible. From the claims he made were, of course, the standard claim, which many Shias, if they meet more educated Sunni Da'is will hear, which is that the Ahl sunnah or those who call themselves the Ahl sunnah are actually the real followers of the Ahl al-Bayt and the Shia are quite far from the original teachings of the Ahl al-Bayt. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon the Ahl al-Bayt. Now, of course, this is a claim which many of us will have heard. It's a claim which, of course, has to be made because, dare I say, we live in a world where when one first hears that Shias have this attachment to the Ahlul Bayt and they first come across the concept of the Ahlul Bayt, it's somewhat of a shocker for some. Because none of the other sects really place this emphasis on let's call to the Ahlul Bayt or let's show this special respect and veneration for the Ahlul Bayt. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them all. And so when you hear a Shia first speak about them, there's this tendency to think to yourself, wow, who are the Ahlul Bayt? And what's so special about them? Then you realize that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had a special unit, a family, and that this family have a special maqam, a special position within the religion of Islam. Now, of course, for those of you who might be hearing that for the first time, I'm not talking about my viewers, I'm talking rather about those who hear this for the first time and do not follow the school of the Ahlul Bayt, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them, they would be somewhat confused. And their reaction after that can take several, several different directions. One of them would be to be very interested in learning about Shiism. Another one, which dare I say all human beings suffer from to a certain degree, is to be quite defensive. Defensive of what they already believe and to feel quite threatened by the fact that their beliefs are being challenged. And normally under such a circumstance, what someone will do is quickly do a quick Google search, try and find some very quick answers because everything has to be so quick in this fast modern world that they want to dismiss the Shia claim. And one of the claims that we'll come across is of course that the Shias do not follow the Imams, rather the 12 Imams for those who believe in the existence of the 12, or the 11 Imams for those who deny the existence of our awaited Savior, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him and may Allah hasten his reappearance were actually followers of the Ahl sunnah wal Jama'ah. This claim was of course the same claim put forward by my respected and amicable friend who happened to give this talk known as schooling the Shias. Now I have several reservations about this particular claim. I think it's one that needs to be addressed head on. And inshallah ta'ala tonight in this, what I've named sarcastically a Christmas special, that is exactly what we're going to do. And that is just purely for the amount of youth that contacted me about this video in order to show them that, look, this claim is nothing more than a grand rhetorical challenge, which when you look beyond the surface facts and the contradictory claims made within it, doesn't really pose much of a threat whatsoever. whatsoever. And if anything, is one which would expose the inconsistencies 
of the one making the claim. And without further ado, inshallah ta'ala, let's jump straight into the topic. As I've mentioned, those who follow any major sect of Islam would love to refer to themselves as the followers of the Ahlul Bayt of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa for numerous reasons. Firstly, when a Shia first meets an individual, one of the major claims they will put forward is to introduce them to the narration we now know as Hadith al-Thaqalain or the Hadith of the two weighty things. Thaqal is something very important which is left behind. So the Hadith of the two weighty things is a narration which is generally cited and of course those Sunnis who hear it for the first time would be very confused. Why? Because from their pulpits all over the world for some strange reason we hear the general fabricated narration, or the general weak narration rather, which states, I leave behind amongst you two weighty things, which all, if you hold on to them, you will never go astray, the book of Allah and my sunnah and my practice. When one hears this, they generally would be confused as to what this means. What does it mean? that this is the, one of the two weighty things left behind. But dear viewers, we're going to take a quick break, inshallah ta'ala. Join me after the break in which I explain this even further. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear respected viewers, thank you for joining us on that short commercial break. Um, rather, it wasn't very commercial because no commercials were shown, but the reason we took that break was, of course, due to a technical issue. And that technical issue is one that should be apparent for any viewer that's watching. Of course, that technical issue is as people broadcasting live from the holy city of Karbala or anyone recording from the holy city of Karbala, particularly in such a strategic location where we have the shrine of Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas behind us, you would always hear at such a time of the evening or even during the day, large amounts of visitors, pilgrims, who have come to visit the shrine of Imam al Hussein, the shrine of Abu al Fadl al Abbas, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them both, reciting eulogies in their own native languages. And that is exactly what we have in the background. So, dear viewers, I do apologize for any difficulties which one picks up in terms of sound, but this is merely one of the sacrifices we have to make, and indeed one of the honors that we have to face in the holy city of Karbala. Back to the topic we were originally discussing. One would normally be confused as to what is the true narration? Is it that the Prophet has left behind his Sunnah and his and the Quran? Or is it actually that he has left behind the Ahlul Bayt and his and the Quran? The answer to that is of course obvious for anyone that watches Shia programs regularly. You will not find an, a single authentic narration in which the Holy Prophet is stated to have said, I leave behind two weighty things, Thaqalain, Kitab Allah wa Sunnati. Yes, there are some narrations that say, I leave behind two things, the Book of Allah and my Sunnah. But as for Thaqalain, you will not find this particular terminology. Rather, you will find that he leaves behind the book and the Ahlul Bayt. Now, this leads to some confusion. If that's the case, does that mean that the Shias are the right ones for claiming to follow the Ahlul Bayt? And why haven't I never heard my preachers, my scholars saying that they follow the Ahlul Bayt? And this is what the question really leads to. So the dilemma put forward by the honorable speaker in the video was that Shias do not really follow the Ahlul Bayt and one of the reasons for that is the claim of transmission. That we can't really trust what the Shias claim to follow. Rather we, and he would be coming from an Ahli Hadith or a Sunni perspective, happen to follow the Ahlul Bayt. Is this claim true? Can we move beyond the surface level facts and reach a proper conclusion. On this particular claim, I believe it's actually real easy to understand that the Shias are really the followers of the Ahlul Bayt on this issue by pointing out one single fact which completely demolishes the claim of the others. Namely, what does it mean to be a Shia? Uh, what are the legitimate sources of fiqh for the Shia? What are the legitimate sources of jurisprudence and guidance? 
For those who call themselves the Ahl Sunnah, it would be any narration which is authentically transmitted back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But for the Shias, they would say that anything which is demonstrated to come from the Ahl al-Bayt, people like Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, people like Al-Hassan wal Hussein, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them. As long as it can be proven to go back to them, then we are compelled to follow it. But this leads to a dilemma because the question is, do those who call themselves the Ahlul Sunnah also compel themselves to follow such things? And that's a legitimate question that we want to be asking. We find that not only do they not claim to follow such things, but on the contrary, their own statements bespeak quite the opposite, that they don't follow them. This is found in the manuals of what we call Usul al-Fiqh, the science of what is the philosophy of jurisprudence. Az-Zarqashi, in his book Al-Bahr al-Muhit, volume 6, page 450, he states, Issue 6, the consensus of the Ahl al-Bayt, the ijma of the Ahl al-Bayt is not a hujjah. And the intended meaning of the Ahl al-Bayt here is Ali and Fatima and Hassan and Hussein, Rivwan Allah alayhim, according to the particular individual here, who is a zarqashi And he says, khilafan li shia Namely, that is to say, we disagree with a Shia here that the ijma of the Ahlul Bayt is a legitimate hujja. Now, if you're a Sunni and you're wondering, well, how does that prove you follow the Ahlul Bayt? Well, on a theoretical level, it does, because what your Sunni scholar here is admitting is that if it's proven that Ali and Fatima and Hassan and Hussein, with the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them all, had a position, then that position is not a binding hujja. It's not an authority on you. Meaning what? Meaning you don't follow them. Whereas your own scholar admits that it is a binding position on the Shia. So at least at the theoretical level, we Shia start off with a point of following them. And that makes us quite different from the Sunnis. Likewise, Abu Ishaq Ibrahim bin Ali al-Shirazi, in his book, At-Tabsara fi Asul al-Fiqh, he likewise states on page 386. Now this is an individual volume. اتفاق أهل البيت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ليس بحجة وقالة الرافضة هو حجة لنا. Again, he states what that the ijma that the agreement of the أهل البيت is not a حجة but the Shia who he refers to as the رافضة say that it is a حجة. Another statement of recognition. Likewise, Ar-Razi states in his book, Al-Mahsul, Ijma al-Itra, Wahdaha laysa bi hujjah, Khilafan lizzaydiyya wal-imamiyya, Lana, inna aliyan, And upon, according to his statement, Ravi Allahu an, Khalafahu wa sahaba fi kathir min al-masail, Wa lam yukul li ahad, Mimman khalafahu, Inna qawli hujjah, Okay, so he says again that the statements of the Ahlul Bayt, the statements of the progeny of a Prophet, he uses the word etra, are not a hujja. And he gives the example that many Sahaba went against what Ali alayhi salatu wasalam, believed in and never once did Ali actually say to them, people, my opinion is a hujja. So what we see is at the theoretical level, we start off with the Ahl Sunnah do not follow the Ahl al-Bayt and the Shia submit to the opinion of the Ahl al-Bayt. This is clear for anyone to see who goes into the books of Asul al-Fiqh for the people who follow the Ahl Sunnah. Now someone might argue that these people are not Salafis, so why should I really take what such individuals say as a particular proof that we don't follow the Ahl al-Bayt? These could be the people of the Mawahib, and the people of Mawahib might differ from the people who follow the Salaf as Salih. Excellent. We come now to the statement of Ibn Uthaymeen in his book, Fi at Ta'liq ala Sahih Muslim, volume 9, page 80. He states, La yumkin an nukhta' as Sahaba, Ravi Allahu anhum, ala qawlihi, fi bayat Abi Bakr, wa nusawwib Ali ibn Abi Talib. It is not possible for us to fault the companions in their giving allegiance to 
Abi Bakr ibn Abi Kuhafa. And actually say that the right is with Ali ibn Abi Talib in what Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam saw. لِأَنْ مَا رَآهُ عَلِي رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ مُخَالِفْ لِلْظَاهِرْ مَا جَاءَتْ بِهِ السُنَّةِ Because what Ali saw contradicts the apparent of what the sunnah has come with. So again we see, according to this admission, there's not a following of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Now, whether or not you want to argue Ali ibn Abi Talib can make mistakes, that's a different issue. We're asking the question, who follows the Ahlul Bayt? So what we see from these statements is, someone that says such things does not follow the Ahlul Bayt. Not at all. Such statements are not things which give us confidence that someone follows the Ahlul Bayt. Now, in regards to whether or not the narrators of the Shia are Majhul, Majhul, according to this video, it means unknown. Unknown here is to say that we can't trust the narrators of the Shia because they're not known to the books of Rajal. Okay, let me ask the question to the respected brother in the video. If these people were not unknown, if they were known in the Shia books of Rajal, would that mean that you would follow them? No, because there's plenty of narrations from known people in the Shia books of Rajal and you don't follow them either. So why are you bringing forward contradictory claims and claiming that these are legitimate points of conflict that would give us confidence in rejecting the Shia school of thought. Again, this is a case of what I call personal pontification, which is that the Sunni religion has laid down a certain criteria of evidence for what they think is true, and they want to impose that same criteria onto everyone else. This is not fair, and it's not engaging in a dialogue. It's called a monologue. But for those who want to be confused by such issues, we ask Allah Azza wa to guide you by the right of the slain martyr here in Karbala, Imam al Hussein alayhi salatu wasalam. Dear viewers, I thank you for joining us on this very short Christmas special. And I'd like to thank the viewers for sending this video to my attention, even though it was a waste of my time and I plan not to engage in such in future. It was necessary for me to address such claims, but tomorrow we will return back to our usual topic, inshallah ta'ala. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.